Hi Ninja Nerds, in this video today we're going to be talking about adenosine. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Comment down below, don't forget to subscribe and check out ninjanerd.org where we have all of our lecture notes and illustrations for you guys to check out. And I really hope they help you guys. So, adenosine. We're going to talk about this medication. It's one of those medications that once you see it done in practice, you'll never forget it. And if you're anything like me, you weren't aware of what was happening in the room. You were just told to go in there and then internal freak out. So, Adenosine is a medication that we use to treat supraventricular tachycardia, also known as SVT, right? And when we talk about supraventricular tachycardia, we're talking about anything above the ventricles, right? So supra, meaning our AV node, our SA node, something's going on and it's causing this arrhythmia to occur. Now when we talk about SVT, heart rate's gonna be going really, really fast, okay? It can be said anywhere between 150 to 250, beats per minute, some books even say 300, right? So you get a patient, comes in, you put them on the monitor, or you put them on the pulse ox, right? And you're looking at them and you're like, yeah, it's not a good phleb, it's not looking right, something's funny, and then you put the electrodes on them and you're like, uh-oh, uh my heart is going real fast. So SVT has got a rate of 150 to 250, but it is regular. So when you see it on the monitor, it will be regular. It's going to be hard to determine whether there's a P or a T because they're usually coupled in with each other and you can't see them. So what are some of the causes that can occur with or that can cause SVT? One of the causes of SVT can be sepsis. So they have some type of underlying infection that we can't see at the moment. Could be something that is stress related. So you can think anxiety. You can think CHF, COPD. CAD, coronary artery disease, all of these can cause stress on the heart. And we can also think of stimulants. What are some stimulants? You want to think about drugs, think about cigarettes. So there are many causes to SVT and there's, we can't nail it down to just one thing. But with the signs and symptoms, these patients can also vary, right? What can occur with these signs and symptoms? Well, one, patients can be asymptomatic. They can come in and they're coming in for something else, which has totally happened before. They walk in, they say, I don't know, I've just been feeling blah, not feeling that great. And we're like, okay, we put them on the monitor, we check in their vitals or something. And all of a sudden we're like, do you feel anything in your heart? And no, not really, but really their heart's running a marathon at 220. So some patients can be asymptomatic, but some will be symptomatic. And they're gonna come in for those things that you would normally think someone with a heart issue is gonna come in for. They're either gonna complain of being short of breath, they're gonna say they're fatigued, they're gonna say they have chest pain, they're gonna say things like palpitations. They might say other things that would make you concerned like nausea. And when we hear things like this, this is immediately where we go into our, our natural like correlation of algorithms in our brain. We're gonna say, okay, this patient's, maybe he's got cardiac issues or they're having oxygen issues and I'm not really sure, so we gotta start checking them out, right? And when we start checking out this patient, we're gonna be doing our nursing interventions of getting vital signs, putting them on the monitor and possibly checking an EKG, right? Especially when you get them on the telly at least, telemetry, you're gonna see that something's going on with their heart you're gonna have an EKG done. When you get that EKG done, you're gonna be notifying the doctor, more than likely placing an IV, because you're gonna say, uh-oh, this looks like SVT. Because the heart rate's going so fast, we wanna also move very quickly, because we wanna get this patient back into a normal sinus rhythm. So, what is the thing that we're first going to try? What is the intervention that we are going to primarily do first in order to see if we can convert this patient back to normal sinus rhythm? You should be saying Valsalva maneuvers or vagal maneuvers, right? So try a vagal maneuver. What are you gonna have them do? You can have them do a couple different things. They can blow in the syringe. You can have them bear down like they're trying to take a poop. I've seen ice packs go on the neck. All of these vagal maneuvers are going to help them, hopefully, convert back into normal sinus rhythm. Does it work? Not typically, but it can. While you're doing all this, while you're sitting at bedside, maybe with the doc, and you're saying, okay, yes, Mrs. Jones, I want you to put this syringe in your mouth and you're gonna blow like you're blowing a balloon up really, really hard. While you're doing that, hopefully you've notified people for help and they're getting the crash cart nearby, they're getting some medications, 
and they're making sure that they know. The provider knows, uh, uh, your charge nurse knows, everyone's aware that this is happening in this room, okay? While this is all going on, Doc's gonna say, okay, we're gonna get adenosine, right? And that's what this whole video is about, adenosine. So what's going on with adenosine? So adenosine is gonna be our antiarrhythmia that we're gonna give this patient or to put them back in that sinus rhythm. It's really important that we give adenosine fast, rapid IV administration, why? Adenosine has a half-life of about 10 seconds. It works in about 10 seconds and then it starts to not work. So we wanna make sure that we are getting into the patient very quickly. And to do that, you can use a stopcock with another nurse or you can do the double push mechanism that people use. Whichever way it is that your policy and procedures work in your hospital allows you to do this and is the best, safest way for the patient is the way you should be doing it. When we give it rapid IV, we wanna make sure that we are following the correct dosages because there is too much adenosine that you can give the patient. So we're gonna give this medication, right? The first time we're gonna give them, we're gonna give them six milligrams, right? We're gonna follow it with a flush. They say anywhere from 10 to 20, all right? When you give them the six milligrams, you give the 10 flush right away, it's, it's all in. What you're gonna see on the monitor is something that I wasn't really prepared for. You go in the room as, a, as a, maybe a student nurse and you're watching them give adenosine. You're like, okay, cool. So the two nurses are giving the adenosine. There's the doc in the room. They got the crash cart. They're on the monitor, all that. It's ready. We're shooting vital signs. They're just rolling. And you're looking at the EKG, right? You're looking at telemetry because that's going to show us the heart, the heart rhythm. So we're in SVT. And when you give adenosine, you're going to see it basically stops the heart. The patient sometimes feels like they're dying. They will say, I don't feel good. Uh, or they have this impending doom feeling. And when you're in the room not ready for that, and you're looking at the monitor and the heart rate starts going beep, 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 and then you see these long pauses, you start to have an internal freak out. But as a nurse at the bedside, you wanna relax and know that this medication only works for about 10 seconds. So eventually, the heart rate will come back. Will it come back normal sinus rhythm? Hopefully, hopefully we ought to do a six milligram dose and that's it. If not, we can repeat the dose we can do a 12 with a 10 ml, and then we can do another 12 with a 10 ml. Usually at this point, then the doc will decide to use some other type of medication. But when you give adenosine, remember it's rapid. It's a half-life of about 10 seconds. You're gonna give six the first time, then 12, then 12. Always have that crash cart available at the bedside and make sure that you are talking to your patient and your whole unit is aware of what's going on in this room, okay? So I hope that makes sense because with these patients, once that medication wears off, we usually monitor them for a little bit, check the troponin, check their heart enzymes, and then they can eventually go home. So I hope this made sense, and as always, until next time.